All right, good evening, guys. Welcome to Advanced Refrigeration Podcast, the third episode. I'm going to talk about some definition. It may sound really lame, but like a lot of times, you know, people ask you know, what this means or what that means. And, you know, a lot of times that, you know, when trying to chop over the phone, sometimes terminology is probably one of the best things that you could have on your side. You know, if you're t- calling something, something else and trying to t- tell this to the other person on the phone, you know, they're, they're kind of <laughs> lost. Season tech should know all these terms. And it, like I said, it will make a diagnostic, you know, easier when being at the phone at two o'clock in the morning, when you're trying to discuss what the hell's happening. Kevin, you want to start in what we're going to go over? Yeah, sure. So we're going to go over a glossary term that most tech should know and uh, try to make everybody's life a little easier. And it's time to try to get everybody up to speed when we're, you know, using these terms. So. People aren't confused and uh, having to look things up later. So with that said, I'll uh, go ahead and start it off. Uh, first term we're going to go over is SSE, which would be a saturated suction temperature. That is essentially your suction pressure, saturated, saturated suction pressure, pressure converting temperature. So your pressure on the suction side converted to temperature whether it's dew point for figuring out superheat or bubble point for figuring out subcooling on a liquid side or midpoint for evaporator control or suction control. So that is SST. So SCT would be saturated condensing temperature. So that would be your droplet or discharge pressure, condenser pressure converted to temperature so your conversion for that so that would be your high side pressure converted to temperature the next term would be delta pressure so delta pressure would be measurement of two different pressures so high versus low so whether whatever you're trying to measure high versus low so delta pressure would be an example would be across the defrost differential valve. So you're measuring a delta pressure. You have the high pressure on the inlet of the valve, low pressure on the outside of the valve. So you're measuring two different pressures, the equal pressure. Delta temperature, along the same lines, two temperatures for measuring delta temperature across them. Delta T could be on an evaporator, could be on a condenser. So your delta T from Inlet air to outlet air, your kind of evaporator from your box temperature to your supplier temperature. So that would be delta temperature. Any measurement of two different temperatures. Brett, the next couple? Yeah. VAP TD basically would be taking your saturated suction temperature versus your discharge air. Most older cases, you know, back in the Early 80s, late 90s, where, you know, they had about a 14 degree TD on most medium temp cases. Now, what that means is your uh, saturated suction would have to be about 14 degrees in order to maintain 28 degree discharge air. So you're taking your saturated suction, so you're taking your pressure of whatever your suction line is, is running at, convert that to a temperature and basically add that to the TD of the, of the evaporator. Nowadays, most, most evaporators have a 10 degree TD. So once again, what that means is, you know, you're in order to achieve 28 degrees, you're maintaining an 18 degree SST, you know, basically an 18 degree saturated suction in order to achieve your 28 degree discharge air. And then you have some high efficiency cases. Tyler started with the HV style cases. Those had a four degree TD. You also see Hill Phoenix NRG cases. Those also have a four to even possibly three degree TD. Condenser TD. Condenser TD is basically the ambient temperature versus your saturated condensing temperature coming down your droplet. If you were to be at a 100 degree day and you're calling that evaporator, say it has a 15 degree TD and it's 100 degrees outside, then that means that your saturated condensing temperature would be about 115 degrees. So the difference. To get your TD is basically your ambient versus your saturated condensing temperature. That would be the TD. Now that'll also be stated on the refrigeration schedule. Under the condenser section, it should basically tell you what the TD of, of the condenser is. 
Um, the next two, I'm going to have to give you because the only evaporator approach that I've ever been privy to are with working with chillers. I know if I'll any of that stuff tonight. No, yeah, evaporator approach has more to do with chillers. So, I mean, you could still have evaporator approach on your air cooled, but it would be, uh, it would just the same as calling it. But so evaporator approach would be you're leaving fluid temperature minus your saturation temperature. So for us on the refrigeration side, this would be for glycol. I mean, we see a lot of glycol rack up here. So evaporator approach is essentially a measurement of your leaving chilled water temp or your glycol temperature minus your saturation temperature. This is going to be a real good indication of how well the chillers work and how efficiently the chillers work. It's got valve tubes or if it's not moving the correct amount of fluid. So this is a measurement will help you, it'll help you show this is working properly. I try to set these up in controllers so that way you can see it. So this is, you know, something I set up in the sensor and controllers. So you can see the approach temperature. Condenser approach is the same step you're doing it on your condenser so we have a lot of water cooled equipment in racks since we're in urban area in chicago so we have a lot of cooling towers so a condenser approach would be leaving condenser water minus refrigeration and again this this could tell you a couple things this could tell you how foul your tubes are if, if you have a, a gel it could tell you Condensers filed up if they break plate heat exchanger. I mean, this is a real good troubleshooting tool to tell you how much work the actual condensers if you're having head pressure problems or something. I I try to look at it every time if I'm looking at a unit that's water cooled. Try to look at my condenser approach to make sure I'm flowing the correct amount of water and everything is set up properly because otherwise you're going to fall the tubes up. All right, just go. Just going back to approach real quick. Going back to the evaporator approach, I've always been taught usually about eight to twelve degree of approach. You know, basically the difference between your saturated suction and your leaving water tap it would be correct. How are you on that? It depends. There's some new chillers where it's like two three degrees. Well, uh, yeah, there's chillers where it's over over five degrees. They're calling it a a fouled evaporator or flow issue. So like a lot of new chillers are even more than that. I typically see approaches on glycol racks, maybe in the, in the upwards of like three to five degrees, depending on, depending on the load. Cause you gotta remember like most glycol racks are oversized and we're not flowing at the amount that we're supposed to because we have systems shut off so depending on your flow station. So that also messes with the approach. It's going to lower your approach a little as the, as the load comes down. Now, I think this is going to be a good po podcast for, you know, we can talk about, we'll get into glycol racks and, and CO2 racks as well. And, and, uh, you know, the only reason why I was asking about the evap approach, because I, I just recently came across one that basically had a floating approach. So basically has the fluid temperature got down temperature and the pressure started down, you know, obviously it was going to shut off more compressors. But just to make sure it wasn't short cycling that compressor, it actually had in the program that it had a floating approach. So normally we try to maintain the eight to eight to 10 degree approach. And as we get closer and closer to a suction pressure and, you know, glycol temperature, what it would do is actually start floating the approach temperature all the way up to 70 and let the compressors just cycle off the pressure. And then basically, you know, float the, you know, float that approach temperature based off of how close we were or how, if we were starting to go lower than set point. Yeah, I mean, that's, you can get fancy with it. The, the fancier you get with it, the you know, better it's probably going to run. So, I mean, that, that's one way I, I typically try to float my cases off of the coldest case, a couple of them. I'll try to float my glycol temp off that, I target for the rack. So, so my glycol is 22 degree supply or 18 degree supply and my two coldest cases are making, I'll actually float the actual glycol there's a point up, then that'll float the rack up. And 
The next one, hit this one, a C, C, I never heard of this term, CTOA condenser overtemp. Is that the difference? So, Got uh, CTO would be a ten condenser temp over ambient. So, this would be your condenser temperature over ambient. So, it, it would be similar to up from. Okay. So, this would be what your what your what your target should be. So your condenser temp over ambient would be like, okay. So if you're running, yeah, it's ninety degrees outside, and your condenser is rated for eighty degrees. So your CTOA should be one hundred five. Your your target for your condenser is one hundred five. So this this is what your your estimate condenser is your target. So this is this is this is what I try to you know preach to new guys. If if you don't know what your measurements are supposed to be, then you're not not going to be able to figure out what it's doing because you don't know what it's supposed to be doing. So like condenser temp over ambient. If you find the TD of your whatever you're working on, so say if it's condensed in size for ten degree TD at, at whatever temperature, so if it's seventy five degrees outside, you start with eighty five degree TD or condenser temperature. So that'd be your CTOA tire. So that's going to change, obviously, if you have a headmaster, you're going to have a minimum, but that gives you a slide if you're working on a unit. More so like for single units, it gives you a baseline of what your head pressure should be. Same thing with indoor units. That's why I really like the measure quick app. Is you can actually, in the refrigeration section, you could actually put your CTOA in there and your evaporator temperature and we'll put your targets on there for you so you could actually see what your targets should be. So you can see what your temperatures should be and what your pressure should be to give you kind of an idea especially newer guys an idea of what should be going on you know what your target should be and then you can kind of work back from there all right i'll go with the next one ambient basically it's just the, the temperature outside when you're dealing with air cooled condensers, it's very important that it's just it, you know, typically they just do over ambient temperature. When they're dealing with evaporative condensers, you gotta figure out the TV because they're using water in that evaporative condenser. They usually try to find the wet bulb temperature. Basically, that's a calculation between your the relative humidity outside and the temperature outside. And that's what they use to calculate, you know, because you are using water in an evaporative condenser, you, that's what they're trying to figure out to use the T for the T D for. Anything you want to add to that since you deal with a, a lot more? No, it's pretty much spot on. I mean, you're going to float off your wet bulb outside right. with the air cooled. It's going to be, it's obviously, it's going to be floating off of just normal outside air temperature. EPR, evaporative pressure regulator. We covered this extensive in the last two podcasts, but just to, so you're aware, the EPR is typically either right on the outside of the, of the particular case or lineup that you're working on. And or could be all the way back at the at the rack if you're dealing with a straight up parallel system. If you're dealing with a loop system, you it's gonna be the end of the lineup. C R O T, crankcase pressure regulator. It just stands for close close on rise of outlet. And T S them stands for tap. <clears throat> Basically what it's trying to do is maintain the outlet pressure <clears throat> going to the compressors under a, a high high load situation. So if you're you know, you have a little system that's frozen food and goes into a D-flux, typically the load coming back to the compressor is going to be higher on a single system because there's not another compressor to, to turn on. So the crankcase pressure regulator is there to make sure that compressor does not overamp to, you know, after a defrost pull down. The next thing you're going to talk about was the whole regulator. That was one of the valves used on the drain line. So we talk about the condenser. We have the discharge line going to the condenser. Coming out, you have the drain leg or, or drop leg. That drain leg, the regulator goes, controlling the head pressure for the, basically the the discharge pressure as well as the drain leg pressure to make sure we don't go any lower than our minimum saturated condensing temperature. Kev, you want to hit the other ones? Yeah. So we got suction group. So suction group would be any group of compressors that is controlling a common suction header and or loop pipe. 
So this would be basically like a rack. I mean, you could have multiple suction headers on a rack and suction groups on a rack. So a suction, a suction group is just a group of compressors that are controlling suction saturation temperature. So that would be a suction group. Floating suction pressure. So floating suction pressure is basically a computer control strategy where we are varying the suction pressure in our coldest case temperature. So we take our coldest case temperature and it's, it's 28 degrees and it's a meat case. That meat case is 27 degrees and it's consistently getting lower. So since we're making temperature on that case and it's our coldest case, what we end up doing is we don't need to run the rack saturated suction temperature as low as we do. So we could raise the suction temperature saturation up. So what we do is we tell the computer that it can raise so many pounds, so many minutes to look at this case. And as long as this case is above or below a certain threshold, keep stepping up the rack pressure until it reaches its max float layer or catch the warm up and it starts to lower the pressure. Now, this does several things. It's a ton of energy because the rack isn't working as hard and our compression ratio is lower. It smooths out the operation of the rack because now all the other systems, the EPRs or solenoids or whatever's controlling temperature or EPRs, are all going to be open more. It's the saturated suction temperature of the rack is higher. So everything's going to start to open more. So your load becomes more. The last thing it does is it helps reduce compression ratio because now instead of running a, I'll say 10 to 1, you'd be running a 9 to 1 or an 8 to 1. As you lower your threshold on that compression ratio, or get, get them closer together, you're going to save a ton of energy. So this floating suction head pressure, it is a varying suction pressure based on a temperature. It's your lowest case temperature. Floating head pressure is some, somewhat close to this. So what we're doing is we are floating head pressure based on the ambient air and our condenser PD. So we float that suction or that head pressure off of outside air versus that's a saturate. So say we have a 10 degree TD. So we're running a 70 degree outside air. The step point for the rack would be 80 degrees. So the rack is going to try to get an 80 degree set point. This keeps our condenser running in the most efficient way possible. So that way we're not running fan horsepower. We're not really by running more fans. So we keep that right there and we see uh, that also float head pressure down lower. So we come down lower, we reduce the compression ratio, we reduce the discharge pressure, we reduce the discharge temperature because we're running lower lower compression ratios. So you save a ton of money. And it also reduces wear and tear on the rack by reducing reducing your discharge temperatures. It also will make compressors larger when you start reducing that pressure because now they have less compression ratio, so now the compressors are larger. Dad, that bro? No, I think you nailed it. So the reason, like you said before, the, all, all the reasons why we why we do it. One of the biggest ones is is saving at saving energy, and on top of saving wear and tear on the rack. You know, not only you're decreasing your discharge superheat, right? So by then doing that, you are lowering your oil temperature. By doing that, you're saving the longevity of the compressors. Plus, because you have a more steady stagnant load, because the load's not varying all all the time, you end up getting less cycles on your compressors. Yeah, you, know, you keep that load more, more centralized, more, more steady throughout the whole day. Yeah. You're obviously going to, you know, less, less on and off with this, with the EPRs, less on and off with the liquid line solenoids and more steady time of, you know, mass load coming back 
of just keeping everything cooler. You know, more run times, cooler such and temperatures, and just all the way around here, so you end up saving money and longevity on equipment. So surge receiver. So I've heard lots of guys call this different. So a surge receiver it would be a solenoid. It's in the drop leg and the receiver outlet. So what you would essentially be doing is when this solenoid opens up, you'd be bypassing the receiver, but not like this would be for when your temperature is low enough outside and your droplet temperature is low enough. It's how most people, you're taking nice subcooled liquid and bypassing the receiver where it's enough warm from the room, and just putting it in the liquid line. So this would be from bypassing your receiver, basically. Now, a lot of guys, you'll find these valve blow up. A lot of old timers, they don't work, or they call them splash gas. They work. I mean, if you have a full, full cycle, a full droplet, you're going to have a full column coming down to the liquid header. I personally don't like to run it off just droplets. I like to let the computer make a calculation off the subcoolant. So if I have, you know, three to five degrees of subcoolant and it's below a certain temperature, yeah, I'll bypass the receiver. So if it's below 70 degrees and it has maybe like 5 degrees of snow cooling, I'll bypass the receiver if I have one of these. If I have control of it, I'd rather run off soft cooling. What do you think about that, Brett? I totally agree with you. So, I mean, back in the day when there was arc well, large 22 and 5, that was probably fine. You'll find a lot of the older racks, the orange fill racks, the, the earlier Tyler racks, a lot of them bypass the, bypass the receiver based off of the Based off of just drop leg temperature. If the drop leg temperature got to 65 degrees, I don't really just bypass it and, you know, it, let it let it go out. Probably because they knew that it would, if it's at 65 degrees, most likely if the thing's signed for, you know, 95 degree liquid, we'd probably have some sub going. I guess that was the only saving grace that they were thinking. But like the uh, nowadays having, uh, right. and it's almost impossible to not set up under, under, you know, actual sub cooling because of all the glides and all the refrigerants. I mean, trying, you know, we all know that typically, you know, most refrigerants need at least a four, I don't know, three, I'm, I'm split between like three to five, four to five degrees of sub going coming out of the receiver. Cause by it, it could be by the end of that pipe, it could not have enough sub going to actually get to the last case. And you might end up having some flat gas. So I, I agree with that totally. When I first saw a surge receiver, I thought you were talking about something entirely different. So up in the, the guys that. Up in the Northeast, I know for sure we had old Boulder Hill rack and they had this, this thing called a served receiver. It wasn't a blow through receiver was it basically would, it would, if it didn't, if the system didn't need enough, as much liquid as what it thought, it would stack a little bit of refrigerant into the surge receiver. It doesn't have it in and out. It just had one pipe at the very, very bottom that would let, let liquid flow in if it, you know, if it was, if it was overcharged. And basically when it would need it, then there was two sensors on the, on the liquid line right out towards the plate glass and basically had a flow through plate glass. So you actually took off both ends of the you see you have to through it. Well, this, this assembly would basically see if the site glass had bubbles in it. And by realizing that it had bubbles, it knew that there wasn't enough refrigerant in the pipe. So what it would do is actually send a signal to a cylinder that was on top of this, you know, surge receiver. And basically put gas into the, you know, hot gas into the top of the uh, bypass receiver, a surge receiver, and basically blow that gas out into the, that liquid out into the system and then maintain a better sub one. It's, it's comparable to a old school of I regard rack, but we'll get into that in a little bit. But I just, that's what I thought you meant when I saw that list for the first time. I saw surge, a surge receiver, and that's what I thought you were talking about. Yes. We call those up here like hat Yeah. Racks. At, no, a surge receiver to me would be like, would be that a surge valve. But no, I see where you're coming with that. Like, we always call those expand uh, tank racks or, you know, atron racks. But yeah, I can see where you got that. Go ahead. So, that's the next one I like to go over is the Bio Guard. So, Bio Guard, 
a Tyler coin term is basically a grant made by Tyler. A zero zone has some Hill Phoenix as their version of cost as their version of it is a rack basically uses being sub cooling and actual sub cooling to run the rack. The receiver is basically an expansion tank or a storage tank or buffer times when the sub cooling gets high. This rack is extremely efficient. It runs the head pressures down, uh, some of them down to 99 pounds, some of them down even lower at times. So it is basically a rat that floats the head pressure with almost bare bottom bones minimum pressures and temperatures. It does this by massive amounts of subcooling as it gets colder out. Uh, when it was like minus five up here, I mean, we have stores that are running. 99 pound set points for low and medium. They're running fine because I mean, that rack 40 or 50 degrees of sub cooling. Because you, it's not uncommon to see them up here when it's negative five to see a liquid line that's for us to because it has so much sub cooling. The first time I saw that, I, I called my boss and I was like, There's something wrong. There's something seriously wrong. He's like, well, Is everything running? I'm like, Yeah, but the liquid line, it has ice on, like everywhere. Like you can really cut something. Like, nope, that's the way it's gonna work. But move on. Yeah, I mean, I see a lot of new guys accidentally undercharge or overcharge these because they're trying to maintain a receiver level. And the receiver, if you, you know, especially with, I always tell guys, it's Tyler Red, it's blue. If it's a Tyler Red, you need, a, you need to trace out that receiver pipe. It isn't almost same size in, same size out, same size out, and it's only going in one way. And it's a half or five inch line. Generally, that is probably not a rack. It's probably an environment rack. Mm -hmm. That rack, if you start dumping a bunch of gas in it, you're going to have problems. So that rack is a floating pressure rack. We're, we'll do an entire podcast. And we get puzzle. I know quite a bit about them. But everybody has their their own bird. Zero Zone, Hill Phoenix, Husman. Everybody made one of these and has their their own version of it. Some are better than others, but it is basically what a guard is. It's a floating head pressure rack. So it floats the head pressure and saturated depth and temperature with the outside ambient air. It uses critical charge, basically, in order to keep to reduce refrigerant charges. And basically, those racks are trying to maintain, what, 12 degrees of subcooling all the time, right? Yeah, anywhere between 12 and 14 degrees. I, I like to float mine up here. Like I, I get fans to control, and the, I actually change the set point as the outside air temp warms up. So as it gets warmer outside, I lower the subcooling target. So that way I'm not stacking so much gas in my condenser, and my pressure gets a little bit uh, less high in the summertime. And then in the wintertime, I tend to overshoot my target a little bit when it's in the fall, so I can gain a little bit more subcooling. But yeah, they're, that's uh, the books points, basically. Glide. Glide is basically the difference between if you look at a PT chart and you're comparing two different types of refrigerant, or I'm sorry, one different type of refrigerant versus if it's a liquid state or a, a vapor state. You'll notice when it's super heat, you'll see that the dew point, you know, for a certain refrigerant might say that it's you know, 35 degrees. But then if you look at the, the look side, it might be different as far as if the refrigerant's in a liquid state, the, the actual saturated will be lower by up within, you know, 10 degrees. Certain refrigerants have more glide than others. Big ones that we deal with, the 448, 449, 507. They say that 404 is a glide refrigerant, but 5.1, like there's not, there's not separate two PT charts for 404, but I mean, if we're going to get specific about it, yeah, technically it's a glide refrigerant. So bubble point. Yeah. Bubble point would be, it has to do with the glide. So just what Crap was talking about, bubble point would be your liquid side of the glide. So that would be on your liquid saturated 
temperature. So discharge pressure, liquid pressure, anything you do with a high side of the system, it be just bubble point on the BT chart. Midpoint is going to be average of doing bubble point. So we use midpoint for a couple of things. So we want to use midpoint for suction control and the suction groups. We want to use midpoint for EPRs. We use midpoint for cadaver application. We use midpoint for control. It's a more the way of doing it. technically that refrigerant. So if it has a 10 degree PV or a 10 degree glide, and it could be anywhere from the do and bubble point. So we go for midpoint for shooting for seven EPRs. Rad suction pressures and eat and suction groups, you get a better control for midpoint tweaks from there. Can I add to that, bro? Uh, if you'll notice, like, uh, if, you, if you set up, you set up the sub cooler, like, they used to, you'd say, if you want to set them up for 35 degrees that, I'm sorry, 35 degrees, PV, which means, you know, if you're trying to maintain 50 degrees, you're trying to make a 15 degree PV off there. If you try to set up a sub cooler now, now with all these glide refrigerants and you set it up for that 35 degree saturated, you'll end up, you know, the temperature of the leaving of the, of the refrigerant will end up going all the way down to potentially 40, 30 degrees because of the glide of that refrigerant. So when, like I said, when, when he said setting up the EPR for that glided set point, I'm sorry for that midpoint. It just works out a lot better as far as averaging the, the temperatures of, of all the cases together. Correct. Uh, next we'll go over dew point. So dew point would be the low end, of the glide. So you're going to look on there, you're going to see that dew point is the lower end of the glide spectrum. So what you're going to look on there is point is per super heat, basically. So when you're setting super cases or anything, you you want to use the two point size of the, the PT chart. So you don't want to use the bubble. You want to use the two point for calculating super heat. That is what we use it for. We have on here, we have digital input. So a digital input would be any input to a control system that is a closure. So it's going to be a Relay close, switch close, mechanical control closing to input board, any type of closure. Now, you could have what was called a dry contact, which would be CPCs, all dry contacts. And it, it's just no voltage. See a closure, whether it's a switch, control, contact, just, just a momentary contact. You could have what's called a wet input, which Dan Floss has some, Pound for All definitely has some, other controllers have some, where it actually has voltages in input, 120, 208 volts. It's actually looking at the voltage to see whether it's closed or open. That would be what a digital input is. So the, some of the things you'd use a digital input for would be compressor, compressor proof using a current sensing relay, basically if the contactor is sensing, sensing current off of the contactor, then, it, or I'm sorry, the contact, set of contact, basically amperage running through the compressor, it'll, it'll close and then send a signal back to whatever control system you're using to tell it, in fact, that it is, you know, is in fact running. They also have defrost termination, so it's the contacts, basically the high voltage side would be connected to the termination clicks on clicks on thermostats, basically whenever they close, sends a signal to the relay, which closes the dry set of contacts and sends a signal to the, the input board. Like you said before, hot, you know, hot inputs, ones that actually have voltage going through it, those ones can go up to 240 volts. You'll see them on Dan Fawcett and Control. If you were to do some kind of control change out where you're going to CPC, you'd have to make sure you're in a, a pilot relay. Was you'll hook it up exactly the same, and uh, you'll have an AI or sorry, an DI board on fire. 
Paul, let me tell you this. I learned that the hard way. The first time crawl. I we fired up the rack all at once. I watched a 168 AO plus, which is like a twelve hundred dollar board, just go up and smoke. Giant fireball is the first two compressors came on, proofs came on, and blew the board into pieces. That's horrible. Oh yeah, expensive mistake. Mistake right there. <laughs> analog input. So an analog input any input varies. So whether it's resistance, whether it's voltage, pressure, any, anything that varies. So a pressure transducer, a temperature sensor, a refrigerant level sensor, the outside air temperature sensor, light level sensor, any kind of sensor that gives you a very output, meaning a scalable output that is not a open or closed signal, it would be varying. Anything to that, Brett? No, most, uh, most analog inputs and digital inputs, the, the, dry, the dry set, like you would see on CPC, they usually put out a voltage. There's, there is a selector switch on the Emerson style analog input boards. When you shut off, there are oh. two ways that these can be on or off. When it is in the on state, it's wanting to see anywhere from a temperature sensor to a digital input. If you have it on setting, you're actually putting five volts DC out, you know, to your sensor or to your, you know, to your digital set of contact. If you turn that off, it's actually taking that voltage away from that input that's because it's looking for the the voltage that's being generated from the device that's considered a transducer transducers take voltage from a from a voltage supply you know usually 12 or 5 volt dc basically to power up that device then what it does is it induces a voltage back out to the common and the signal to shoot out a voltage range for the high low range of the, of the device that you're using so if you're dealing with a liquid level sensor they can be one to two volts. They can be one to five volts. They can be 0.5, 4.5, you know, whatever range that they are, you have to make sure that you're matching range and whatever device that you're at actually utilizing is matching. So if it's zero to a hundred, you have to make sure that it's programmed for zero, zero to a hundred in the full range of their actual device. Same thing with pressure transducers. You'll see uh, zero to a hundred and then you'll see 0.5 to 4.5. For CPC, that's what you, CPC usually utilizes. Or on Novar, you'll see zero to 400, uh, yeah, zero to 400, and it'd be one to five volts. So there, you have all different types of ranges, all different types of pressure ranges and voltage ranges. And just be, be advised and just make sure that you're checking that when you're verifying a pressure transducer. You know, if you have a false reading, it could just be because of a programming issue that no one ever caught. So the next thing I want to go over is subcoolers. So a subcooler would be a mechanical device, whether it's proven shell, brace plate, heat exchanger, that is, or a tube and tube that is mechanically cooling the liquid temperature going to our coils or case or liquid header. So a mechanical subcooler would be a device that's using suction gas off the rack or it's using suction gas for another rack or it's using economized vapor, which that's a good one we'll go over next. Economized vapor from the compressors to cool down the liquid temperature. The reason we do this is when you subcool the liquid temperature, you increase the efficiency of the liquid. So now it is a lot easier to cool with 40 degree liquid than this 90 degree liquid. There's a lot, lot more richer quality liquid. And this also allows for smaller valves, smaller liquid lines. So all around subcooling, better alternative, not subcooling. Especially when you're flowing your head pressure because your temperature doesn't vary as much. When it doesn't go from 90 to 60, you know, throughout the year, you're in a kind of 50 to 40 degrees. 
or to whatever the customer set point is. You, you want vapor injection? Yeah, sure. Vapor injection is used. It's actually put in on a part of the compressor. It's actually, yeah, you know, it's no, no discharge pressure or more uh, suction pressure. Don't know, almost like they call it an intermediate pressure and miser board. Basically, you're cool, uh, cooling the the wind, or I'm sorry, the windings as well as the uh, the discharge portion of the compressor by injecting cool vapor directly into the mid part of the, the rotors or the or the pistons on a compressor. You're utilizing this because the typically you'll have an economizer pour on a compressor that has a higher compression ratio. This is to reduce the amount of heat going to the compressor for, you know, for that, you know, while it's compressing. Usually we get the economizer pour off of the outlet of the subcooler. So from the, you'll have the subcooler and then where the liquid is feeding out through the suction, it'll stop at the EPR. That way you're controlling your temperature at your subcooler. But then that's uh, that subcooled, I'm sorry, that the superheated gas is going to end up going into the economizer board of the compressor to help cool down, to help cool down that compressor as well as the oil. Correct. I mean, that subcooler is a huge, huge importance on a vapor injected compressor. Without that subcooler, you're not running any, any cooling compressor where it needs it, where it would need liquid injection. So if that sub cooler is down on the vapor and scroll or screw, you're tremendously going to increase your discharge temps and could damage the all compressors and all, all the compressors. It messes with your compression ratios also. So it actually takes away capacity from the compressors because you don't have that interstage compressor pressure anymore so now that compressor is you'll notice better. in the summer times your your suction pressure will actually be elevated you can actually see on a graph basically when the when the subcooler stop working because you'll see the suction pressure start to start to delve up because you start you know you start losing energy of that refrigerant being circulated when you know more of that energy being derived in the like super yeah well so that'll be it for tonight guys I appreciate you guys all listening in oh. wow that was a very good story. Bye. Good power, good hair, and I quit. Keep your eye at the ball with it all power. Remember, practice, practice, practice. But here you had to do it properly. <laughs> Did you hear I finally graduated? Yeah, and just a shade under a decade, too. All right. You know, a lot of people go to college for seven years. I know. They're called doctors. <laughs>